Okay, welcome to episode 50 of the Market Maker podcast series. So yeah, hard to believe we're, we're at the 50 marker, Piers, but, but here we are. And living up to what we committed to in our last episode, we put out to the community um, people to email me in terms of their favorite episode. And yeah, the inbox lit up. There were, there were tons of really great responses, actually, and for, from people all over the world, which is just you know, truly amazing when you get people messaging you from like Argentina, South Africa, India, as well as obviously in the UK where we are, where the majority of people are. So shout out to Punit, who is in India. He agrees with us about Tesla, doesn't like it. <laughs> also a shout out to uh, Praveen, who actually reconsidered his Facebook strategy after you pretty much decimated them, I think in episode 47 about where they're heading. Um, but he likes he likes to Google Play. Um, and then Declan. Declan pretty much wrote me a thesis <laughs> about all the different things he liked, which was which was great. He actually really enjoyed episode 27 going all the way back when actually I did a conversation about trading crypto. Uh, oh, yeah. So obviously Ah, oh, what with Tim? With Tim, yeah, our senior yeah. Uh, our senior trader. So yeah, he said he got a lot of great advice out of that. So if you trade crypto. Go back, episode 27, there's some really useful nuggets in there that will be really useful. Because uh, I always think it's either complete novice or you're so that far down the crypto wormhole, it's hard to have a conversation with people. But Tim did a great job at giving an even-handed approach. But the person who I chose is on the call is Carty. So Carty, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great this morning. Uh, how are you guys doing? Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And, um, you know, I, I chose you just to give this a bit of a, um, a stage here is that I remember you from when we, when we as the company were working with Credit Suisse, I think you were a summer analyst last year at the time. Yeah. And I remember it was during the break, I was delivering a macro lecture, everyone turned their cameras off, you left yours on during the break, and I could see you beavering away on your laptop during the break. And I said, Hey, Carty, what are you looking at? And you said, oh, I was just looking at, you mentioned uh, about the, the yield curve inversion. I'm just seeing like what, what that is and how it works and when it's happened before and what the, and I was just like, well, this guy's serious. Like he's, he's, <laughs> he, 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 he's really committed. And I remember you were always very, um, very much engaging when we were having conversations. So I thought that was great. And then, you know, you gave the shout out for the, the 10 year investment episode that we did. Mm -hmm where we gave a stock pitch, which was your favorite. But yeah, may maybe then the purpose of this was to really give you a platform. So tell us a little about yourself and where you're from and where you study and, and we'll go from there. Yeah, no, um, I really enjoyed the Fridays we had at Credit Suisse. Um, it's definitely like a highlight of my week to be able to trade um, using fake money as it were. Um, but the bit about me, um, so I'm a PPE student, which is politics, philosophy and economics at the University of Nottingham. And uh, I chose PPE because I uh, initially came from the International Baccalaureate, which is not so well known in the UK, but you just do six subjects with um, philosophy on top. And so it gave me a bit of a broader um, outlook on my surroundings. And then a bit about me in my free time, I do loads of sports. I do rugby, karate, badminton, and I do chess. Don't know if that counts as a sport, but we'll, we'll include it <laughs> nonetheless. Um, yeah, the biggest one of them is definitely karate. I got my black belt when I was 15, but now chess is definitely taking a, a, a predominant role. I'm a nationally ranked chess player now, so we're going, we're going on strong. And then, yeah, I, I, I started off um, just doing banking from internships. I got interested because my brother was talking to me about private equity. Something called a poison pill was the first thing that got me <laughs> um, or, or and a Pac-Man defense. So yeah, I, I, I watched the podcast a bit religiously um, when I'm just out for a walk or, or going to do some shopping. Um, so it, it's great to be on it. Oh, that's that's incredible going from karate to and chess national rank that's awesome that that for me Pierce and about you if I was interviewing someone that came up I'd be yeah like, yeah that, that's the guy <laughs> I think my position on this podcast I, I feel threatened <laughs> I, I'm not here to take your position Pierce <laughs> so where, where's home 
Where's actually home for you? Are you are you in not are you from Nottingham or yeah? So currently, right now, I'm in um, my Nottingham studio, but I live in South East London in Lewisham. Yeah, so that's home, and um, I'm from Jamaica and Ghana. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I now know why. One of the reasons why you've picked uh, Ant was at uni in Nottingham, right? Uh, Ant? Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> Carty, Carty, you just missed him though, because he graduated about seventy-one years ago. I think. <laughs> and I and I used to live in South East London, so yeah, okay. there's nothing like keeping it keeping it within your tribe, you know. But, but what I'm most what I'm most group. impressed about Carty, tell tell them what what you're doing. You, you've managed to sandwich us in between yeah. interviews with. Tell, tell us, you've just yeah. literally just stepped off an interview, right? Yeah, so I'm currently at an assessment centre. I won't say who, but um, it's a pretty big firm. So I really hope that, you know. Well, I know who it is. And yeah, it's definitely a big firm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I, I have, my break was at 10. They overrun to 10 past 10 and I'm back on at, at half past. But I, I just figured I'd do this quick podcast, <laughs> interjection. Um, I'll get my blood flowing and then I'll go back and um, tell them why I love IBD so much. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, you're an absolute champion for, the, for, for taking the time out, given the, the stress that most people feel in the middle of an AC, you're jumping out onto a podcast. That's just, yeah, that's unbelievable. But look, what I'm going to do is I won't, I won't take any more of your time, but I'm going to put your LinkedIn um, your like LinkedIn address. I'm going to drop yeah. it in the bio of this podcast. So on Spotify, Apple, I'm going to share it on LinkedIn, give you a shout right. out specifically. So to live up to the promise, I want you to get some visibility. Um, so everyone, you must connect with Carti. <laughs> Go out there and do it. Build Check the him network. Out, guys, it's definitely worth a look. Check him out. Yeah. No, forget IBD. It's the karate chess future <laughs> that we're heading for. <laughs> all right yeah. Carty well look fantastic to have you on and uh stay in touch and all the best for the rest of the assessment center yeah Great. good luck thank you guys appreciate you good having Carty. me on all, all right, right. thank you okay. bye all right so usual plan of action then for for the rest of the episode and Piers just before we begin I mean I couldn't I definitely wouldn't even consider taking on I mean, I'm just going to jump out of an AC jump on a podcast and that be cool cool as that balls of steel i mean <laughs> i'd hire him just for that alone <laughs> actually forget about freaking just just stop stop the assessment center that man's hired yeah oh what a what a star but um but yeah look it took going back to the to the pod then let's um let's move things forward and get and get and get back on track and yeah, the episode 50, um, one thing that I did see and I wanted to mention, um, because I know we obviously have quite a few recurring listeners, anyone new to the channel, but Spotify, I found out just the other week at the end of 2021, have added now a rating feature on the app. Ah, finally. And finally, they've woken up. And um, that I'm, I've read is going to be one of the calculations that will feed in, as we know, these secret algorithms that help promote the pod and so on. So, you know where I'm heading. We, <laughs> we, we did the Apple push, but now it's the Spotify push. And I know certainly a big portion of our community is UK based. And I think most UK people use Spotify rather than Apple. That's from what I talk to many people. And so... All you need to do is go onto the main market maker channel page and there should be a star rating. You literally, it's way easier than Apple, actually. You just hit it, give the star, done. Um, five, please, not one. <laughs> and um, yeah, that, that will massively help us. Um, at the moment, uh, before I even noticed it was there, it's already on 40, which is, which is fantastic. So thank you for those 40 people. I'm going to set a stall though and a marker I want to hit 250 by the end of Q1. Okay. 250. Like it. It's, it's much easier. It's much easier to do. Super quick. Takes two seconds. It helps us out massively. Spreads the, the word. Um, so, yeah. It, 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 I'd just be thankful if you could do that. We, All right. We can, so, we can rate ourselves, right? I'm just going on and rating. I'm rating ourselves. <laughs> <by> rating. <laughs> 
All right, so look, let's um, let's move on. So I'm going to give a bit of a wrap of the week. Feel free, as ever, Piers, to interject if you feel it's needed, and then we'll talk about the main topics, which we're definitely going to discuss: Microsoft, the acquisition of Activision, Blizzard, and then also what that means in the race for positioning in the metaverse. And we're also going to talk about some of the kind of classic stay-at-home trades, which got hammering um, last night which was Netflix and Peloton down around 20, 25% each respectively. So they're going to be the main talking points, but to give you a bit of a flavor and a wrap up of the week. So beginning of the week, and actually they've gone twice now, the Chinese central bank have been cutting their benchmark lending rates. Um, we have seen GDP there uh, it continues to slow down, obviously just in the wake of the pandemic. So the economic slowdown, the world's second largest economy resulting in their central bank taking action this week. We've also had in the region, North Korea, tested two tactical guided missiles on Monday. And it is now the biggest string of missile launches since August of 2019 uh, at this point in time. Um, before anyone gets too nervous about that type of headline, it is relative commonplace, certainly during the 2018 period, I remember. And during the Trump period, it was yeah. definitely something that was happening um, bi-weekly, uh, essentially. You always remember so, uh, Rocket Man, and uh, what was it Trump was saying? You're fire and his famous fire. Fire and, and fury. Yeah. Oh yeah, and that was when I remember that because when he said the statement "fire and fury," and obviously the S and P got whacked on the back of that because people yeah. thought, "Oh my God, this is like escalation to the next level." Do you know where he said that comment? The context. What? Where was he? What? What? Yeah. Where, uh, <laughs> Where do, what do you think he was doing when he made that comment? Probably eating a burger in bed. <laughs> he was, he was, uh, he was in, just come off the golf course in the clubhouse. Uh, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so hard at work. Yeah. Working the, you know, the back nine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so other things this week, we've had Biden... And, and on the theme of, of kind of North Korea and China, he said he's not ready to lift tariffs his predecessor imposed on Chinese imports, despite calls from US business, businesses to uh, relieve the duties. That's totally unexpected. We talked about this many times before. He hasn't changed um, the direction of that and is very unlikely to do so going into the midterms. Then, of course, lots to talk about Russia preparing to invade Ukraine. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken is meeting his Russian counterpart today, in fact, of hopes of lowering the temperature a little bit after recent diplomatic efforts in Geneva were deemed a failure by Moscow. And there's not too much of a unified front in NATO yeah. either at the moment. So any feelings on that? And well, I know Macron's been fairly vocal. I mean, this is it. I think it's quite interesting. I mean, Putin loving this, right? <laughs> kind of perfect for him in that he's being strong man you know, amassing troops on the border. Yeah, yeah, I'm not intending to invade, is his kind of hmm. pretense. But um, he's he's being the strong man, uh, and he's his rivals are kind of at, are, are not unified, right? So it's, it's, it's the perfect situation for him. Um, and this has kind of been definitely a strategy for his for, for years. And he's definitely in a, in a, what he will feel is a you know positive period, and uh, yeah, you saw that with Biden. And you know when you throw Biden in, he made that bit of a gaffe in his yeah. press conference, which just again, I think you probably, I think my views on Biden, I've been fairly consistently clear on how what I think about Biden um, uh, on this podcast. But just again, another example where I just don't think he's he's cut out for for this. But yeah, I think look, there's a. There is a lack of unity, but there'll be nothing like an invasion to concentrate the minds of the allies, shall we call them. Um, I think until, I, I, yeah, I think we're on the back foot. I think we just wait. I think the West just wait for Putin to do something and then go, oh, my God, right, we better act. Um, and so Putin's always on the front foot, which is where he wants to be, of course. Um, yeah, and, and what timing is also optimal given the kind of wholesale gas situation at the moment as well. Yeah, and I guess it's hard one with that Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which at massive expense, you know, Russia connecting 
to Europe. It's not open yet, right? And, uh, you know, that is, that is leverage on the West's side, if you want to think about it like that, because we don't have to open that pipeline, right? So, you know, from a sanctions point of view, you know, there's been plenty of financial sanctions in the past, which have hit hard in Russia, by the way. Those financial sanctions is absolutely a form of warfare, in, in my opinion, and, and creates a huge amount of economic disruption, which then creates a lot of hardship, right? And I think, you know, in the, in, in the last time uh, Russia <laughs> invaded Ukraine or, or Crimea, you know, the sanctions got slapped on hard, and that definitely hurt. So, you know, they are effective. It's just they're not visible. So, you know, there's nothing like a show of strength and amassing troops on the border. Obviously, that's mm. that picture and that image is, 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 you know, delivers a much bigger punch to, to kind of the population. But um, yeah, and to add a, add a few more kind of layers to how complex the geopolitics gets, as I said, the US Secretary of State is meeting his Russian counterpart today. But what is also happening today that's really interesting is there's joint military drills happening. China, Russia, and Iran. Is that right? I didn't know that. Okay. I mean, how divisive is this world we're living in right now? I mean, yeah. I mean that, that says it all, right? That this is a this is the the, the kind of confrontations and the, the the what Biden needs to deal with is there's also China as well as Russia. And so it makes strategic sense if I was China or Russia yeah. to somewhat align with themselves because yes, Russia wants the Nord Stream, but also China wants to deliver the Silk Road kind of ambitions yeah. over the long term, which requires Russian territory. Yeah. And, you know, I think like, if you listen to the Ray Dalios of this world, you know, he very much is kind of the front and center of his thesis is these massive, super long cycles and that we're mm. due were due uh, a conflict, right? I think we've gone the longest, is it the longest ever where we haven't had some kind yeah, of, um, peace, yeah, the longest ever peace time. So, you know, in his eyes, it's inevitable that we return to some kind of global war. I know it sounds, just sounds weird to say it, our generations where we haven't ever been directly exposed to anything like that. It just feels mm. like such a parallel universe that could never happen, right? But yeah, he's got a great history. chart that he always shares, Ray Dalio, which is the, it's like a it's like a what, 500 year chart and it looks yeah. at civilization change. Yeah. And it's got at the moment, the descent of America, which obviously yeah. hammered the British empire back yeah. in what the 19th century or so. And then looking at it now, the acceleration of China and how that's what's really underlying the current state of play yeah right? and it's the change in superpower and it's the change in the global reserve currency and it's a period where you've got a lot of the rich poor divide gap widens which creates a lot of diversive bipolar political mm -hmm. climates and then you get more extreme political parties getting into office which then leads to more extreme policies and then the divisiveness rises. I mean, I think even Ray Dalio, I think he puts the chances of an American civil war, at, I think it's up to 35% chance in his eyes. Of, I mean, and look, that sounds just so sensationalist, but, you know, then we did just go through the anniversary of storming the Capitol, right? right? So it's kind of, on the one hand, you might say it's a fair assessment, but um, I think this is something for investors, right? You, it's, it's always been, for my whole life, it's always been a risk, um, you know, of some kind of conflict. And when Putin starts rising up and getting a little bit more aggressive, you know, it's always on the agenda. But it never happens. That's been the default for our generation. The risks are there, but it never happens. And I think we always kind of live on that level. But, yeah. It's got to be something, obviously, to monitor because, you know, if anything did escalate dramatically, then obviously it's a complete game changer and, and all cards are off the table and it's just an entirely unique event for our generations. And so yeah. I think investors are, look, let's carry on regardless and obviously monitor those risks, but, but for now, not take them too seriously, I think. Right. So the important take-home point here is that 
as as much as there are always multiple macro kind of topics or themes concurrently ongoing it's about forming a hierarchy of of what's going to be the influential factors over your investment period yeah uh, i guess and then assigning appropriate probability to the risks of those materializing that was kind of the thing about the whole <laughs> i remember whenever North Korea would fire one of their intercontinental ballistic missiles said to also have um, mastered miniaturization of a nuclear warhead device strapped on the top. You'd think, <laughs> oh my God, this is the end of days. Yeah. And yet the S&P would bump down a percent yeah. and everyone would load up and buy into it. And it, by the end of the day, it would be 2% above where we were before the dip. And that would happen every time. It was just an opportunity to get long in this ever rising market. Yeah, And um, that's not to say that these things don't go without risk because one miscalculation and certainly when you're re relying on technology and things to make assessments on direction and travel of things of missiles to counteract things, things could go wrong pretty quickly and escalate. But yeah, these are all assigned probabilities, uh, I guess is the key thing. But okay, other, other things we've had are uh, Brent crude oil moved to its highest level since October 2014 um, this week. So kind of, I guess, diminishing kind of impact of Omicron, or at least the belief that people have as we go further forward. Um, supplies tightening as well. We've had outages in Libya to North America. We had the drone attack on all facilities in the UAE. That was actually this week on Monday. Geopolitical tensions, we just mentioned, are kind of simmering at this moment in time. So there's a couple of things at play there. Goldman Sachs, they raised their Brent forecasts through 2022 to 2023. They were obviously listening to you and they said, we predict $100 in the third <laughs> quarter. So thanks, GS, for listening to the pod. Yeah, um, the but, pod. but one thing I would say is you did get called out and I do want to address this. Someone said, you said 100 bucks, but you didn't say when specifically. Well, so, I said, uh, didn't I? I said in 2022. But yeah, right. maybe this, that's this, this person yeah. wants... Uh, wants yeah. more you, accurate. You, you've got year... Quarter month. Well, it's going depends to be how on, far you want to take it. It's going to be on the 14th of uh, <laughs> it's going to be 11 31 a.m. No, hold on, um, run, your, run your model and then <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah, yeah, I'd say second half of the year. Okay, okay, okay. So, so I said to you the year, <laughs> the quarter, <laughs> or the month, and you went, No, nah, I'm going to throw in a, a fourth element here. <laughs> okay, well, I'll let you off with that second half of the year. Page two. Well, like right, quarter yeah. three, quarter three. Okay, so you're in line with, with the GS, the GS view, or they're in line with well, you. I think they're in line with me. you want to see it. Okay. They're in line with me, yeah. So it's it's talking, of, talking of Goldman Sachs, then their shares were down about 8% um, earlier in the week. We have earnings season. Uh, it's really going to pick up actually next week in terms of volume of companies reporting. Now, GS, just from memory, I think they had record investment banking, asset management, wealth management, um, net revenues. But this is a really, you know, just to make the point, record breaking numbers there, the stock fell 8%. <laughs> because don't forget, you know, markets are forward looking. A lot of this stuff is well known given the deal activity yeah. we've had over the pre previous period that these numbers were gonna be sensational. The, the problem that they had was weaker trading revenues, and just rising expenses. I mean, I don't know if you've read some of the headlines, Pierce. I, I wrote about it in one of our newsletters. Like They are paying out yeah. some serious dough to their employees to stop them going elsewhere at the moment. Yeah, bonuses have, bonuses have been good this year. Right. And then uh, for the senior folk, I think the partners, um, they were not only getting uplifts on their pay, increased sizable bonuses, they were also getting one-time additional million dollar type on top of one of what you know, one time sweetener uh, just given how competitive the space is at the moment to to retain talent yeah so the other thing then is uh, morgan stanley and I, I wanted to give them a shout out because they posted better than expected fourth quarter profits on strong equities trading revenue and they've kind of held the line a bit more on the compensation costs uh, and i guess investors just liking that um, because one thing I would say, generally speaking, the downside is, is that, right, I don't want this person to leave this company, so I'm going to throw some money at them. The problem is now, 
you're not going to have record breaking advisory fees growing year after year after year after year. It doesn't quite really work like that. But now you've thrown a couple million bucks my way. Yeah. What do, what do, you know, when my expectation now is, well, you paid me X. Yeah. Now I want X yeah. plus Y going forward. Right. <laughs> and how are you going to do that? And that's why the stock's down 8%. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I, I think it's a tough one. Obviously, keeping workforce happy, uh, retention is obviously key. But ultimately, is it is it a sustainable model? I'm not sure. Anyway, elsewhere to wrap up the week, crypto and talking about it at the best time, actually, because it's just kind of thrashed out new lows. Bitcoin down about 8% in the last 24 hours that we're recording this on a Friday. Um, Ether also down nearly 10. Other layer ones such as Solana, uh, Cardano are down as well. Generally, the theme here being crypto markets just freaking out over higher yields like everything else is that's tech and growth oriented at the moment um but look let's yeah. let's get on to the first the first conversation piece which is that of microsoft uh, nearing its deal to buy activision blizzard which would be the biggest tech deal in history topping the dell emc merger of 2016 so i mean it's a it's an absolute giant um, transaction. One thing we did earlier in the week is when this news broke, Eddie and I jumped on, we discussed the deal and its terms more, more there. So if you just go back one episode, you can check that out. A couple of things I want to say, then I want to pivot this to more a conversation about the rationale and the, the kind of strategy for, for betting on the metaverse, which I guess ultimately fundamentally is what this is. So a couple of things is I was reading about Activision and in 2006, they bought Guitar Hero. Did you remember Guitar Hero? Guitar? Actually, yeah, I do. Yes, yeah. I, do, I do vaguely remember that. Yeah. Oh, this is when, this is when that, I actually... About the air guitar. Um... This is when they had like a little miniature guitar that you'd yeah. play and you could play like Metallica, things like that. And you would just press, you do, you do the keys on the actual yeah. guitar. But and this is... With... <laughs> oh, I mean, I heard the news, so... Yeah, R.I.P. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, 2006, I think, was when I'd moved in with my brother and we were sharing a flat, me and my older brother. And he's a big, he's a big metal head. And uh, so he went out and bought Guitar Hero when it first came out. I remember this. And you know what we did? We went out, we bought the, we bought the guitar, we bought the drum kit. <laughs> we bought the, and what we would do, we'd go out and then we used to come home. We would put it on full volume. I'd have the drums. He'd have Just the guitar. Jam it up. We'd be like... jamming till like <laughs> five a.m. in the morning, much to our kind of neighbor's delight. Um, but yeah, the, so in two thousand six, Activision bought Guitar Hero, and they bought it for a hundred million dollars from a company called Red Octane. Um, hundred million. Yeah. That game actually would later make the top ten best-selling lists of all time. Wow. So 100 million they paid for that. That was an incredible acquisition. This is Activision. Then two years later, Activision merged with uh, Blizzard, the studio behind the PC hit Warcraft, which was then yeah. owned by Vivendi. And that transaction was just under 20 billion. And then they gobbled up Candy Crush yeah. from the Sega maker King for just under 6 billion in 2015 to tap into the fast growing mobile market. Remember, this was 2015. Yeah. I know we all use our smartphones. You know, we probably spend too much time on our smartphones 2022, but this was 2015. So those three acquisitions gave them gaming for mobile, console, and PC. Yeah. So quite, quite an interesting backstory, actually, to how they perform. There's a lot of negative stuff as well that's been going on <laughs> more recently. An interesting character, um, Kotick, the main guy there. But look, the, the timing of the deal is what's interesting. There's so much conversation about the buzzword that's metaverse and, and Web3 and so forth. Gaming is seen as kind of the key to really strategically move in that direction because of the existing online communities there. But I know you've got some, some stats and some thoughts about yeah. that. Well, I know it's, yeah, it's obviously when, when you get a big 
you get a big deal like this and, and don't forget it's not happened yet and mm. um there's definitely some possible barriers in the way and i don't know what the regulators might say but anyway um when you get a big big kind of big numbers and it's like wow yeah massive move especially if it's one of the big tech firms it, it kind of grabs all the headlines what i would say is that yeah it's de- obviously gaming slash kind of metaverse um it, it kind of goes hand in hand there's a big race for this I, i'd say if you if you kind of step back um these big if, if you think about the big five uh tech firms then then obviously they're all kind of rivaling each other big five alphabet amazon apple meta and and microsoft and um essentially what they're trying to do obviously in the last decade they've absolutely smashed it and they have become the absolute giants of global companies um and i think where they're at now right now is that they're, they're at this kind of bit of a crossroads where now it's like okay well what next because you know History is littered with absolute giant organizations that then actually a few years later or a decade plus later, and actually they've, they've kind of disappeared. There's quite a few examples of these. Um, there's stuff like uh, Fairchild Semiconductor. You ever heard of them? No. They were the biggest company in the world in the 1950s. Not anymore. Um, IBM in 1983 was America's most profitable firm. Eight years later, it was losing money. Nokia is probably, well, I was going to say more recent in most people will know about yeah. it, but actually that was like 20 years ago now where kind of Nokia got um, smashed off its perch or perhaps not quite 20 years ago. But, but you get my point, right? So I guess what all these tech firms are right now thinking is, right, what they want to do is they want to make and own the future. And I guess the issue is we don't quite know what that future is because we're at this point, this crossroads between Web 2 and Web 3, let's say. And that whole Web 3 environment, whilst we, we think, hang on, there's this metaverse idea and there's, okay, there's blockchain and there's DeFi and there's, right, there's, there's AI and there's VR and AR and, and they're throwing all the money under the sun at all of these. But, but actually, we're still at that point where... We're not quite sure in 10 years' time, what will we all be doing you know, as people? How will we be interacting with each other? How will we be consuming products and services? How will we be, how will we be spending our time? And they're, all, they're throwing money at it. And, and, and this Microsoft deal is definitely another example of how aggressive that they're being. I mean, when I say aggressive, um, in the last year, just thinking about, well, yeah, in the last year, right, 280 billion um, has, those five have spent 280 billion in the last year on like R&D projects. That's 9% of the entire American business investment. 9% of the entire country's investment is from those um, five companies. And if you go back five years, their proportion of investment um, was 4%. So they've gone from 4% to 9% in terms of their proportion of company investment. Obviously, a function of that is their, their growth, of course. And there's a great chart. Actually, if anybody get, has the Economist subscription, they, they've actually done a pretty good article on this. But um, when you're looking at the stats in terms of how their investment um, has changed, it's interesting on the one hand, if you look at it from a percentage of revenue point of view, then for some companies, it's actually relatively stable, like Microsoft. Actually, um, this year, Microsoft have invested less than they did in the previous two years. Uh, I'm talking about 2021 here, sorry, rather than this year. They've invested less, even though that from a percentage of revenue point of view, but because their revenues gone up so dramatically, the amount of cash that is, the amount of cash is way, way more than ever before, right? So you've got this wall of cash as these big five, in terms of how they invest in R&D, they do it as a percentage of their revenue. And they're always trying to innovate. And as revenues grow, well, then these cash, the cash that gets thrown at this stuff is quite extraordinary. So actually, their, their R&D and capital expenditure um, 
was um, at 53% of cash flows this in 2021, which is up from 32% from the year before. Um, okay, and that obviously that's they're throwing it at what we call frontier technologies, which is right, what's next? What does that future look like in 10 years? What are consumers going to do? And the frontier technologies have kind of been split into a few different areas. The metaverse, obviously, but then there's stuff like autonomous vehicles. And we've spoken about this with, you know, the, all these big tech firms throwing huge amounts of money at autonomous vehicles, but then stuff like healthcare is really important. And again, something that they're investing in hugely you know, there's side projects like space, you know, robotics, fintech, crypto, quantum computing is a big one, because if you want your metaverse, then <clears throat> the computing power that you need to enable that to happen, I mean, we can't do it yet. So they're investing a huge amount into these cool new chips that can make this kind of uh, computing mm. power go forwards. But in terms of research, the big five companies just themselves have published 16,000 scientific papers in the last five years. So it's, it's definitely the race to win, to create and win the future. Um, and obviously what they're trying to do is not go extinct, like the, you know, the, the graveyard of these giant companies of the past. <laughs> they're trying to avoid that. And, you know, I think it's a really, it's going to be a really interesting decade. And we've spoken about this on previous pods where I think both of us were kind of leaning towards Google as perhaps being kind of best place to maybe win that race. But I think, yeah, in terms of, in terms of what happens next, uh, you know, they're all big movers. This Microsoft deal is just one of many, many, many. And, you know, I think they've bought 110 companies um, in the last five years. These five, com these five tech firms have bought 110 companies. Yeah, with all these numbers, that, like that volume and the yeah. cash number, I mean, <clears throat> there's a regulator knocking on my door here. <laughs> right. So this is right. This is right. This is a really good point. But historically, all those companies that kind of got nailed and, and died, actually, most cases, it wasn't the regulator. Right. Even though you might okay. think, right, these massive companies, okay, they're going to have to get taken down a peg. It actually isn't, the, it's normally not the regulator. It's normally they just, they just don't evolve onto mm. the next thing. You know, okay. Nokia is such a good example. They just completely screwed up the transition to a smartphone. And so this is what they're desperately trying to avoid, which is why they're throwing money at everything even though a lot of it's going to be entirely wasted. You know, you could argue Apple's attempt at an electric vehicle you could argue is an entire waste of money, but mm. they're just throwing money at the wall and seeing what sticks. They're so afraid of not being yeah. in the right space. So I wonder here, more from a philosophical approach of R&D, let's say. So yeah. you have these small, more agile teams that create these new innovative products or services or games in a lot of this conversation. I was reading about the kind of culture at Activision Blizzard. And yeah, as much as there's like sexual discrimination, lots of other things going on. The other thing was apparently they had a work culture that was just, you know, really squeezing their employees. It was a lot of pressure to develop. There was, the, so I, I guess one thing is then you go into this kind of, <clears throat> It's weird. I kind of have this perception of like the Microsoft being like they give you this big handbook and it's like this is how a Microsoft employee or or acquired company must behave and it's the Microsoft code. But at what point then do you not allow these smaller companies to have the the room to maneuver to fulfill the potential of these ideas and execute on those plans before they then get into that more rigid structure where because they're so large the innovation speed will decrease right. but then if i just start buying up all these innovative companies not only am i capping the, the rate of innovation but surely that also increases the regulatory risk because i'm just buying everyone yeah i think you're absolutely right the ability for a giant organization to innovate 
it's a lot harder than a, a startup, um, almost kind of by by definition. And I think that's what has been the failure of these gig, you know, these gigantic institutions over the kind of centuries. And yeah, it's hard, isn't it? Because you buy, and of course, the more companies you buy, and they're buying a lot of companies, then it just becomes harder to have that, yeah, it has that, that one sense of like that one mission, that one, you know, what do we do? I know at a top level, you know, what does Amazon do? Well, they're a distribution company, right? For products and getting products to the doorstep as quickly as possible. And okay, you might say, well, hang on, they're also AWS cloud, works better, but then they're also, well, hang on, they own 20% of Rivian, but you might say, well, hang on, that's because that's playing into their core business because they want to make that distribution cheaper from a cost point of view because they don't want to have to pay drivers and but then you know when you get you know when you get these these giant tangents I don't know Microsoft for example in April they agreed a deal for Nuance Communications that's a healthcare focused cloud and software provider and it's like wow okay well that's then that's way off piste from their kind of core business isn't it and that's just because they're trying to cover that base mm. because the other tech firms are all in amongst that healthcare side you know if you think about you know google bought fitbit for example for a couple of for a couple of billion um whenever that was a couple of years ago right and so it's so hang on if google are buying fitbit hang on apple are all over the healthcare with their watch and stuff so microsoft uh, they, they're forced to have to cover that base just in case that becomes the kind of booming one. They don't want to, they don't want to be left behind if any one of these big elements is, is the real, you know, the, 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 the one that really takes off. So, but it's so far away from their core sort of strategy, it just then becomes more, it's more messy from a, from a kind of a message. Mm. But obviously they've got enough cash um, that it's worth a punt. And I think... A lot of the time, some of these are just punts. Um, Is but, it not? I mean, forgive my naivety, but would it not be better to break up the companies into their own segments so they can be more focused on the the priority and objectives of that one singular department within, within I don't know, a, a group organization sense, but listed on its own? And then well, you satisfy a regulatory threat. And I guess yeah. to play devil's advocate here, I can you really claim that this goes against stuff I've said in the past on this podcast, but can, are they, have they got too much market share? I mean, just think about this Microsoft deal, right? With Activision, even if that went through, they'd only have, they'd have like only, they'd have like 10 to 15% market share. So that, I mean, that's not from a regulator's point of view, that's not like, wow, dangerous, hmm in any way right so if you look at like the electric vehicle market of course they haven't got massive market shares even though they're buying electric vehicle companies left right and center not no no one of them has a market share that is anywhere near kind of getting under regulatory scrutiny but then you think about ai and here i think here's the problem right ai is such an important thing but now it's not a single thing ai really now goes into everything right but how do you be good at artificial intelligence well you need data to learn from and who's got all the data well the big tech firms so it's a really difficult one for the regulator they've got all the data they're much better positioned to be absolutely at the forefront of the ai revolution but then what's that a monopoly on you know, so and anyway, there's five of them. So if they're all in each other's space, and I think actually we're up to a record yeah. amount now, I think now 40% of the big five's um, business activities now overlap. Right. I think it was like 25% um, uh, 10 years ago. It's now up to 40%, right? So they're overlapping and they're competing. So because there's five of them, does anyone have a, a monopoly anywhere? And so I think from from a regulator's point of view, it's, it's going to be hard, but it does destroy innovation. And that's, that's proven time and time again. And if they're not careful, they will be victims, not all of them. But I think of those five, 
you know, in a decade or two decades time, you're not going to have all five of them at the top table anymore. Which ones survive, obviously, is the big debate. Yeah, you've seen those infographics. There's only one company that survives long term. Yeah. Microsoft, 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 <laughs> Microsoft. Always, exactly. always there. Always a bankable podium finish. Maybe it's not true. number one, but always right there in contention. All right. Yeah. Well, look, let's, uh, let's move it over to Netflix because they beat top and bottom line last night. So how much did they go up? <laughs> they went down 20%. Yeah, they went down 20% after hours. That's the lowest levels now since June 2020. Main thing, slowing subscriber growth. So they added just eight, just, I say, they added just 18.2 million customers in 2021. So it sounds like a lot, but actually that's 50% down from the record year, obviously, that they had. Now, I do find this a little bit challenging as the way the market reacts in, I think, a slightly irrational way because yeah. of it's being probably caught up with this whole exit of the pandemic with the whole yield move and the growth stocks getting hit. But of course we were going to come off the boil after the meteoric subscriptions that came on the back of the fact that, you know, they're, they're, when we say lockdown, that's not strictly true because there's a degree of severity to the restrictions that get implemented. And if you think about 2020, it was literally peeking out the front door, can I leave? Or are the Gestapo going to like shoot me down? Like, cause I don't know what the deal is. Like, am I going to catch this virus? Are the police going to come in and arrest me? Like cast your mind back to, to March, April. You, you didn't really know what the deal was. Like, yeah. how do I catch this thing? What actually are the rules? Whereas now it's kind of part of life. Right. And yeah. thankfully touch wood for now, we're heading in the right direction in the sense that yes, transmit transmissibility is high, but obviously symptomatically it's it's lower. So the point being is I don't I'm not that shocked by this, but hence is managing of expectations from a listed company's perspective. And so by numbers, their global paid net subscriber additions were 8.28 million, and that was uh, versus 8.19 million expected, but that's fewer than essentially eight and a half million they added in the prior quarter. Um, the biggest point arguably was their outlook, as is always the case with particularly growth names. And they expected to add two and a half million subscribers during the first quarter of this year. That is below the four million it added the same quarter last year. And analysts, what analysts were expecting, bearing in mind they came out saying they're going to add two and a half million. Analysts yeah. were expecting 7 million. What? So check that out for an outlook. I mean, that by any stretch is a disaster of an outlook that they put out. Yeah, against. but you know why they do that though, right? To avoid oh, yeah. exactly what's just happened. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's, it's like, well, let's not keep making the same mistake. Let's now lowball our forecast right. so that actually we can start beating it. And then our share price will go up and everyone will go, wow, we're amazing. Yeah. And so, yeah, short-term pain, long-term gain, yeah. because <laughs> I mentioned to you just before we came on, Yeah. You know, need I remind everyone that Netflix is up 6,000% in 10 years. So a little yeah. bit of, you know, 20% off the top in order for then managing a share price thereafter. It doesn't seem like such a big yeah, deal. And but... look, that share price spike, the, the peak, we just shy 700 bucks, wasn't it? Um, in, I think you peaked in, in quarter three, four last year, but you know, that's overbought. I mean, that's yeah. like, that's, that's bubble, you know? And obviously you then layer on the inflation problem. And of course, a lot, like a lot of these tech firms, that future, kind of profit needs to start getting discounted because of higher inflation expectations. And so I think when you look at the share price, wow, down, it's down, 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 down. It's, I think you've got to realize probably it wasn't justified being up there um, in the first place. And so it's kind of correcting back lower. Um, yeah. And we're trading, uh, yeah, we're set to open around uh, 400 bucks. Yeah. And you know where we were trading before the pandemic hit? 400 bucks. 
So, right. so basically, we're we're exactly where we were. It just sounds sensational because we've gone so far, essentially. Yeah. So, yeah, a couple of other interesting things. Obviously, Netflix related this week. Um, they did mention on their call post earnings about the increasing competition, part of the rationale for the slowdown. Apple, Disney, so on, having material impact on their growth. Yeah. Um, the other thing as well that some analysts were noting is the slate of shows for the current quarter apparently isn't as strong. And those big titles that are in the pipeline are not going to actually debut until Q2. Mm. And so they've got a bit of a dearth of like new content coming uh, at this point in time. Uh, they raised prices in matured markets um, this week. So US, Canada. This is, this is the, I guess, the struggle here is Raising prices is one way to counteract this slowing growth situation in the short term, but yeah. that's fine in matured markets, but they've, that's fairly saturated anyway. Where they need growth to come from are the Asian markets, and you cannot raise prices there because yeah. you need to start at a lower, the lowest possible price. It's kind of like Netflix back when I used to get the CDs delivered to my flat. <laughs> you know, it was cheap because no one used it, and so you've got to get that you've got to build that up um yeah. so that's problematic but then um also as well as the whole move to gaming i know we talked about netflix a few episodes ago we were talking about their were with were, were contemplating going into gaming and they were thinking about yeah r d or acquisitions but <laughs> as we've just discussed that is a as you said before a fierce space to compete yeah. in right now so yeah, and especially when you especially when you got the big five who are you know, you can't compete with that. Even Netflix, I know, you know, it's a, they're nowhere near the big five, right? Even, even though they've been in this fang thing, mm. but they're, they're nowhere near them. So they can't compete in terms of checkbook size. So, yeah, it's, it's tricky. Come on, what, what are you watching on Netflix right now? Um, I've, I've just finished watching, um, I can't remember the name of it. It's got Eddie Izzard in it. Uh, uh, okay. I can't remember. Go on, what are you watching? Uh, so I started watching la last night um, about the um, Times Square serial killer in the oh, right. late 70s and 80s in New York. I don't know if, I mean, I'm, my mind always gets blown when I hear about what New York was like. Not not that long ago <laughs> yeah. and obviously they had like the crack problem in the 80s and they this was prior to that Times square was a seedy place back <laughs> in the 70s it was where they had the boom of like the peep show and you yeah. know just just you know, really an interesting time and place and yeah there was this guy and you gotta watch it i don't know people listening i'm sure they have but there was basically this flat that got set on fire on the, in Times Square, and they went in there to put out the fire, and there was two decapitated bodies with their hands cut off, right in the room. <laughs> and actually, then it was followed up with subsequent copycat thing. And it's just like, oh my god, this happened in New York in like not that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> Check it out. Okay. I'm sure some people are already watching it. Um, well, it depends what you're into, but it cool? it's pretty fascinating. The time Times Square Killer, I think it's okay. called. All right. Yeah, yeah, pretty gruesome, but um, compelling watching, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyhow, moving back to the conversation of some of the, the big movers, Peloton. Yes. So two pieces of news here. One is they basically came out in a CNBC exclusive last night, and they said they're going to temporarily halt production of bikes and treadmills, essentially because demand is waning. Earlier in the week, I read reports as well that Peloton executives and insiders had sold $500 million worth of their own stock as well, according to an that. SEC filing. Um, so basically, they've just been <laughs> like what you were kind of saying with Netflix being overbought. They, they, they've got in and uh, the selling yeah. started when their share surged past 80 bucks in the fall of 2020. And the sales have just been gaining more and more uh, as the stock got towards and above 100. But yeah, shares down 25% yesterday. Actually, I think they went down about 27 at the bottom. Yeah. I mean, look, I think they're definitely a this is definitely a different story to Netflix. It's, it's not, 
I mean, whilst they are a pandemic stock for sure, there's definitely differences between these two stories. I mean, I think that, I mean, Peloton have had a few issues along the way. Um, they've, they've certainly had, they've certainly suffered from the supply train, um, supply chain constraints for sure. So, you know, customers shelling out for thousands because it's such an expensive product, right? So it's a slightly different ball game. So if you're if you're spending a couple of thousand dollars on a bike, and then it doesn't show up, then you're like, well, you know, where's my effing bike, right? I I want my money back in terms of customer how, how the customer feels about that. Of course, Netflix a it's a super cheap product relatively, and b it isn't physical, so you know you're not having the same issues in terms of delivering the product. Now, so that's the nuance. I mean, I think with Peloton, once you've got the product then fine, it becomes a bit more Netflixy in terms of being a monthly subscription. And you know, you're, you're, you're subscribing to these workouts and you can find Then, I mean, so Peloton's on the one hand, the same as Netflix monthly subscriptions, but they've got this massive barrier in the way where it's a massively expensive physical product that's got to be delivered. And because it's a physical product as well, they've had issues with, I don't know if you remember when they launched their treadmill, Unfortunately, a, um, a child died in, in an accident on the treadmill. And then the way they dealt with that was hor horribly bad. They just didn't do any, they didn't deal with it. And then, then there were more injuries. And then finally they said, all right, fine, we're going to recall optional recall of all treadmills. And of course, this was a, a disaster. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that like Netflix, though, they've got a lot of competition. Um, more competition now than when the kind of pandemic started. Here's a few for you. I don't know if you've heard of any of these. Tonal, Hydra, Mirror. Actually, I know you were talking about the Mirror. You've got a Mirror, haven't you? <laughs> I'm on my Hydro looking at, in the Mirror. <laughs> uh, tempo, Climber. So these are the ones that have kind of just come out. Well, of I haven't, haven't heard of the last two. Yeah, nor have I. Okay. But they, they are, you know, so, you know, there's plenty of competition and look, they're suffering from new user growth decline, of course. So very much like Netflix, they're coming off that pandemic, just, you know, one-off peak that will never be repeated, hopefully. Um, and so they're suffering from a few angles, but where it's worse for Peloton, I mean, yeah, mentioning the kind of directors selling their own shares, clearly that's never a good sign, but also they have now called in McKinsey and they are you know doing things like halting production um, calling in McKinsey so that they can look at opportunities where they can cut costs I mean this now starts to sound actually wow this sounds potentially mm. incredibly bad um, rather than just oh we've just got a slight decline in user growth numbers you know this suddenly starts to feel a bit more hang on we need to fatal. restructure here. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to be fatal, but I think they haven't managed the, maybe they, they could have managed the pandemic better. It's never easy when you just get a tidal wave of demand. It's obviously incredibly hard to manage that. And I think perhaps they could have managed it better. And because of their failings in management, they, they're probably now suffering. And then without some major change, then fine, it might be fatal, but I think they're doing, they're probably doing the right thing, even though the share price is getting hammered and may well continue to do so. It's probably right, let's reset now before it's too late. And I think that's what's happening. They are raising prices as well, like Netflix, apart from their Bike Plus product, which is their, it's the better version that's more expensive. So all prices are going up apart from their Bike Plus. I think what they're trying to do is make that Bike Plus product feel better value even hmm. though the price isn't changing so they're yeah. trying to play a clever trick there i think well no i um, think the you know being a peloton customer yourself i think you should email your representative who whoever you deal with you yeah. should say to him look we have this podcast we talk about different types of things peloton comes up from time to time i can sound super bullish <laughs> <laughs> i can help you guys out you know, well, just, just kick me back some of that peloton plus for a 12-month period. To be honest, I'm still in my four-week 
trial period. So now that the news <laughs> overnight, I'm, I'm tempted to send it back, get a refund. That's it. That's it. Late. But... Hit the man when he's down. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. All right. Well, look, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, obviously, a, a huge thanks to, to Carti for joining us at the beginning yeah. of the of the podcast. Amazing. And remember to check out his profile, connect with him. You know, your network is super important for any student, uh, regardless of whether you're going to finance or any profession. And uh, you never know when those connections might give you value in the future. So yeah, connect with us and connect with him. Uh, I'll drop his his um, link for LinkedIn in the, the bio description. And yeah, don't forget to rate if you're if you're listening on Spotify, it'd be much appreciated. And thank you, Piers. And thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week. Yeah, see ya.